I have a few questions. Uh, first, when the government uh, first informed SPH that it was prepared to extend grants to support its media business. Uh, secondly, uh, what is the size of the funding the government has penciled yearly to support the SPH CLG? Uh, does the government aim to cap the grants it extends with the expectation that the CLG would also secure other uh, sources of funding from the private sector, for example. The third question is, uh, this is uh, with respect to some public documents that were released by SPH last week. It was decided that the SPH contribution towards the CLG would be, was I quote, uh, arrived at after considering various factors, including the potential funding requirements of the new, of the media business for a few years, unquote. Uh, does the Ministry consider this contribution to be a reasonable one? And how did it come to this conclusion? My final two questions. Um, what structures will the government insist on to ensure the independence of the SPH CLG from possible government interference to foster a culture of editorial and, cult and to foster a culture of editorial independence across its titles? And finally, in view of the significant change uh, in this sector, would the government consider the formation of a select committee to allow members of the public and Singaporeans in particular to A, express what editorial standards they expect from the CLG taxpayer-funded mainstream media, and B, to express their views on how best the SPH CLG can ensure editorial independence from any government of the day. Thank you. So I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his uh, series of questions. Um, they span a wide range of issues. I will attempt to give him a comprehensive response, but I, I imagine this is going to be further developed in subsequent clarifications. First, uh, on the issue of timing, about when did we inform SPH that we're willing to fund uh, SPH? I think, as I said in my statement, the government has always taken the position that we are willing to support investments in capability development. And then it is up to the respective organizations to develop their plan and to put forward their proposals to us. In the case of SPH specifically, as I mentioned last year, they received the JSS, which was part of the national scheme. In addition, we were prepared to offer extra help if it was required, but the restructuring proposal was put to us, which then leads to the next question about other sources of funding and whether government funding to the CLG will be capped. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would say that it's premature to specify the exact numbers that will go in regard to the government funding. And the reason for this is not because we are reluctant to talk about them, but it's simply because, first, this is still a matter before the shareholders of SPH. They have to decide whether they want to approve this. It is only after that that we can really get into a more detailed discussion. But it's not just about the shareholders' approval. We also need the new CLG to then formulate its plans and put on the table what it sees as its strategic business direction going forward. And in that matrix, the different sources of revenues that it expects or anticipates and what role will the government funding be or play in that matrix? So the question of whether other sources of funding will be required, I think if the Leader of the Opposition had uh, heard earlier from my speech, not-for-profit does not mean that the entity does not pursue its business on a commercial basis. And we fully expect the entity to seek out advertising revenue, circulation or subscription revenue, and other sources of funding. But we fully expect that government funding 
will be a component of that funding matrix for the CLG. He asked if the SPH contribution, which has been spelt out, which includes the transfer of two property assets, which are related to the media business, and also some other operating businesses which are linked to the media, in addition to the $80 million of cash and $30 million of SPH shares and REITs. And he asked whether this is reasonable and why. Again, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to stress that because this is a matter that has to be put to the shareholders at an EGM, I do not want to preempt any case that the management and the board will make. But I can say that our focus, the government's focus, has been very clearly on the news media business and its viability going forward. Whilst I am unable to say specifics about what the numbers look like in the near term, SPH has said some about how they think it will continue to widen in terms of its deficit. I can say that the medium to long term outlook remains challenging. And that is why we need to be clear that government will be prepared to come in to give support. But how much, how, I think these are the things that will need to be worked out in due course after the CLG has had a chance, subject to shareholder approval, to then develop a business plan and put the proposal to us. The member asked about structures for editorial independence or ensuring a culture of editorial independence. I would venture that that culture already exists in Singapore, in the news media. And I think we do a disservice to our journalists and editors to suggest anything to the contrary. And in fact, if you look at the overall outcome that we have achieved over the years, it speaks to not just from external sources that validate by recognizing the accomplishments of our local news media. But importantly, and this has a bearing on the leader of the opposition's last point on a select committee, because if I understand correctly, it's about enabling people to express their views. I would say Singaporeans have already expressed their views because first, when it comes to trust surveys, Singapore scores highly. Singaporeans have been quick to point out that they trust our news media, both print and broadcast, and they've shared this, and I cited the YouGov survey and also the Edelman Trust report. I would add that even our local surveys, for example, by the IPS, validate this, saying that about 70% of Singaporeans, or seven out of 10, trust our local media. And that is at a higher level than the trust they accord international media, I would add. So it's not just what they say, though, it's also what they are doing. What are their habits? What are their preferences? You know, in other words, how are they voting with, in this case, their eyeballs? And the fact is, as I said, and I'm, I want to re-emphasize, the SPH, news organizations in aggregate have not just maintained, but they have grown their reach and readership when you combine the digital and the physical. That would not be the case if Singaporeans did not feel that they could trust the news organization. So I think the people have spoken and I think it's our job now to make sure the object of their trust continues to succeed. Yes. Uh, I asked about uh, the time when the government first informed SPH that it was about to, that it was prepared to extend grants to support its media business. And I also asked about the size of that grant. Uh, I'm, I would be surprised if the government hadn't considered 
what would be the extent of the grant that it would extend to the CLG. So uh, can the minister share with us if there's any ballpark figure as to what is the amount of taxpayer dollar that will be going to the CLG? Um, minister made a point about the standards of journalism. It's uh, not, a, not a simple uh, issue to address in the course of a ministerial statement, but my generation at least remember this headline, uh, this cover page in the new paper, which was in 1997, at a very sensitive time, just during the elections, and it was a checklist to help you decide how to vote. Um, Minister spoke earlier about objectivity and balance. The only thing objective about this cover page is the EPL scores, no win for Liverpool and also for Manchester United. Uh, the checklist uh, essentially told the voters what you're voting for. If you vote for the PAP, you're voting for upgrading EduSafe and MPs of acceptable character. Mr Singh, if I could ask you to yes, seek yes, your clarification speaker, rather than... I will Expound in a speech. Thank you. I will come to that, uh, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, and I'll be brief. But I, I would agree with the Minister to the extent that one has to be fair to the journalists, because they are good journalists. And a good example is on the 1st of May this year, the Chinese media group head of uh, Chao Pao, Li Hui Ling, uh, she asked some very serious questions about the leadership transition between, uh, to the 4G leadership. And she said internal competition is intense. There's no consensus to pick anyone. And on the other hand, the English papers, uh, major cabinet reshuffle, but now is not the time to read the tea leaves. So there can be different views on the quality and the standards of journalism. And it is for that reason that I put my earlier question to the minister about a select committee and to try and get some understanding from the public what they expect of a taxpayer-funded uh, CLG. Uh, I note the uh, comment Minister made about the surveys, but I think this is an opportunity to hear from the public, and I hope the government can consider this favourably. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I am disappointed that the Leader of the Opposition has decided to make political capital out of something that I think is quite fundamentally important to us. And the, I think even in the examples that he cites, in a way, he has already illustrated the point that I'm making. He went back to 1997 to bring out a, an example. And then he says, uh, just last year, the Chinese media put forward one, or uh, this year, Chinese media put point of view, one point of view, and the English media put another point of view. Uh, isn't this the diversity that we want? Isn't it the diversity that the leader of the opposition has been talking about? So I am not very clear why he thinks the current model is not succeeding. Is it perfect? No. I would challenge him to show me a model that works and that is perfect. But is it one that works in our context? I think it does with some areas for improvement, certainly, but it's an evolutionary process. And even in the examples that the, member, the leader cites, I think it's quite clear. And I would add that what we want, I mean, what we want at the end of the day is not posturing, but substance. So if we can achieve that, not just in the news media, but also in this chamber, I think we would have gone a long way to building a stronger country and nation. As for the funding, he asked for ballpark numbers, but that's precisely the problem, isn't it? I think we should be talking about these sorts of matters when we have greater clarity, because to throw a ballpark number and if I give you a range, then the question will be, oh, it's a very big range. Can you narrow it down? And if I say, no, I can't, then we go back to square one. So the point is, I think we are doing the responsible thing here from the government's point of view. Not just to say that we support the restructuring because we could have stopped there, 
But we went a step further to say that we would be prepared to fund that CLG. That is a significant point which should not be overlooked. And clearly, when the funding is finally decided upon, it will have to come back to this chamber because it will be part of the budget of the Ministry of Communication and Information and the member and his party would have ample opportunity to ask all the specific questions. But I think let's not miss the wood for the trees. I think it's not about the details right now. It's about the overall thrust of what we are trying to do. Is it the right thing to do? Is our news media an important public good that we should be supporting? And if so, has it done a good job up to now in the models that we have used? And if yes, then let's work with that and build on it rather than talk about a complete wholesale overhaul.